great to be here, and I understand uh, from the activity I see on campus that it's a great day to be a Wildcat. So, uh, all right, so um, thank you all for coming. Uh, for the students who are here, um, thank you for taking the time. I am glad to give you an excuse not to be studying um, that might be even acceptable to your parents, at least for a short period of time. So thank you for showing up today. And we're, we've been at college campuses for the last two days here in New Hampshire. And, um, and the reason we have um, is because I think that every decision I would get to make as president would have more of an impact on your lives than it will on mine. I'm 61 years old, and there's much more of my life in the rearview mirror than there is through the windshield. But the decisions that the next president's going to get to make about what happens around the world, what happens here at home, are going to set the stage for the launching pad for your life. And I think if that's the case, and I really do believe it's true, then you all should have a big say in who the next president of the United States is going to be. Now, for some folks who, you know, live around this country, that's just kind of a pipe dream. Because by the time this primary election gets to their state, it may be determined who the nominee is going to be. And you may then just have a choice between whoever the Republican nominee is, the Democratic nominee, and maybe if there's a third-party candidate or two. It will be a very narrow choice. But that's not the case now. And that's not the case in New Hampshire, because all of you have the opportunity to determine who the nominee is going to be. You're first in the nation. This field is narrowed to a point now where if you want to, and if the candidates care to, they could all come and see you here. And they could all come and talk to you and take your questions and try to win your vote. And they should. Because we're going to be the stewards of your future. And I will tell you, over the last seven years, the two guys who have been in the White House, one from each party, in my opinion, have been pretty, come on in, have been pretty lousy, lousy stewards, pretty lousy stewards of your future. And let me tell you why. You know, Donald Trump was here eight years ago, running for president. I was running for president at the same time, so I heard everything he said. And one of the big things he said was that He's a businessman. He knew how to handle budgets. And he was going to balance the budget in four years. And instead, what he did in four years was to add $7.8 trillion to the national debt. That's money that I'll never in my lifetime be able to pay back, but it's going to be debt that you're going to have to deal with. And Joe Biden ran for president, said he was going to do better, and... Just as importantly, he was going to bring the country together. He was going to govern from the middle and give everybody an opportunity to have their voice be heard. And instead, he ran far to the left. He has spent nearly as much money as Trump has spent in his four years. And he's now added an additional nearly $6 trillion to the national debt. So I want especially the students here to understand what that means, if you don't already. There's $33 trillion in debt in this country that the government's run up over 250 years. Nearly $14 trillion of the 33 has been run up in the last seven. And it should be no shock because of who these guys are. Trump is a liar, and he's been lying his whole life. And in his private life, what he does is he lies to borrow money from people, then he goes bankrupt, sticks them with the bill, and moves on. Can't do that when you're president of the United States. Joe Biden is 81 years old. Let me tell you who's not worried about paying the bill. A guy who's about to leave the table. Right? So at 81 years old, he can run up whatever tab he wants. Because he doesn't have to pay the bill, you are. And so, people, I, I did four different radio interviews this morning before I came here, and every one of them asked me the same thing, like, why are you going to college campuses? No other candidate's going to college campuses. 
in New Hampshire. The VEC, I think, has done a little bit. But other than that, Nikki hasn't been here. DeSantis hasn't been here. I understand Trump's coming here next week. Get ready. Because what we do in a couple of minutes, where we spend most of our time answering questions, that will not happen. He will stand up in front of you. He will talk at you. Block off two hours. He'll talk at you for two hours. He'll complain about how unfair life is to him and how you have to help him have life be less unfair to a billionaire from New York City. Um, and that's all you'll get. I'm here because I believe your questions are important and I want you to participate in this process. If you're not registered to vote yet in New Hampshire, you should. Because no matter whether you're from here or not, in this phase of your life, you're spending nine, ten months of your life right here. And your vote means here more means more here than it means anywhere else in the country where you're from. The other 49 states all come in second to New Hampshire in terms of the importance of the vote. And so if you want your vote to have a real impact, register here. You still have time to do it. And vote here on January 23rd in the Republican primary. There is no Democratic primary to speak of. So if you want to have an impact, you have to vote in our primary. And I hope you do. Now, I'm going to try to make the case to you today you should vote for me. But even if I don't close the deal with you between now and January 23rd, and someone else does, I want you to vote for them. Even though it's against my interest. I want you to vote for them because I want you to participate. I want you to get in the habit now of feeling like every year when an election comes up, it's not only your right, it's your obligation to have your voice be heard. And to participate at least by voting. I'd hope you'd do more. But at a minimum, you should be out there voting. And I think that's really important. And so when those folks asked me this morning why I was coming, that's what I told them. I want you to be a regular participant in deciding your own future. Not just in how you study here at UNH, not just in what your first job is going to be, not just in who you might marry or anything else that might happen, because I went to college at the University of Delaware and I found my wife there. And she's still with me, believe it or not, after 37 years. Mary Pat, why don't you stand up and just say, say hi to everybody. <laughs> so that's why I'm here. And this election is not the most important election of our lifetime. Every candidate in every race says to try to get you juiced up, this is the most important election of your lifetime. The reason why I know it's not is we'll have another one in four years. So it's not the most important election of our lifetime, but it is the most important decision you need to make at the moment because the world has a lot of crises going on. We have a war in Ukraine, the most serious shooting war in Europe since World War II. We have war in Israel. We have the Chinese expanding their military capability. We have the Iranians spreading terrorism all around the world and funding it. And here at home, we have a border that is open and porous and having 200,000 illegal entry attempts a month. We have an economy where people have a hard time affording to buy a home, buy a car, borrow money to help their business because inflation and interest rates are so high. We have an educational system from kindergarten to 12th grade, which is failing our kids. 39% of our 8th graders can't read at grade level. 25% of our 8th graders can't do math at grade level. We have a lot of things to deal with. And so the, it's the most important decision you need to make now because you need somebody who is going to be a serious steward of your future and solving those problems is a big part of it. I'll end with this and then we'll spend the rest of the time answering your questions. How many of you just by a show of hands watched the debate on Wednesday night? Well, that's pretty good. 
Thank you for doing that. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to end with that because I want to talk about what I think the debate meant. Look, when you're in politics and you rise in politics to the level of getting a chance to run for president of the United States, most of the people have some pretty decent political skills. And one of those skills that they teach you early on in politics is if you don't like a question, answer the question you'd rather answer. And don't answer the one that you were asked. What I've found over my career is, well, that's a good theory in a political science class. Real voters hate it. They hear the question, they're smart people, and then they listen to your answer and go, what the hell is he talking about? That wasn't the question. And I've been hearing this over the first three debates that I participated in, and it's something that Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley in particular are really good at. And I let it go, well, because the stage was bigger. The time Mike Pence was there at the time, Tim Scott was there at the time, Doug Bergen was there at the time, Asa Hutchinson was there at the time. They're all home. And so now as the, as the stage got smaller, one of the things I thought about, because that's never been me, I'm not good at it. I think it's in part because I'm from New Jersey. Like, we don't tolerate bullshit really well. And, and, and so, you know, you kind of get trained that way and brought up that way. And so finally, for Wednesday night, I thought to myself, okay, if these guys try to do this again, and the moderators are not calling them out, I'm going to. And that was one of the strategies I had going into the debate on Wednesday night. Little did I know I would get so many opportunities to be the fourth moderator. I mean, think about Ron DeSantis, right? I mean, that poor guy. I've never seen somebody in major politics more uncomfortable in their own skin, right? I mean, seriously, right? You put aside whether you agree with them or disagree with them. This is not about policies. I'm talking personally now. Because we get to know each other. I, I've never seen somebody at this level who seems so unsure of who they are and so uncomfortable in expressing it. And like when these answers get done, it's clear they're memorized. right? And when he gets done, I'm telling you, because I've been standing right near him, he, when his answer is done and the red light goes on, he goes, <sighs> like, thank God that's over. I got that out. He just looks so uncomfortable. Part of his problem, I would suggest to him, if I were his ally and coaching him, would be you're uncomfortable because you know you're not answering the question. So he gets asked, is Trump fit or not to be president of the United States? That's a pretty simple, direct question. Either you believe he's fit or you don't. You saw him once that he would not answer. He's lost a little off his fastball. Father time catches up to everybody. What's that mean? Is he fit or isn't he? He wouldn't answer. Would you send American troops to Gaza if you had a plan to try to rescue the American hostages, the eight Americans that are still in captivity there? He didn't answer. He talked about how serious the war is, how tough he'd be on terrorism, blah, 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 blah. 90 seconds of whatever his consultant wrote for him that he memorized, because he's a smart guy. He memorized it, he spit it out, and what they said to him was forever, he said, don't say you're going to send American troops someplace, because there'll be some people in the party who won't like that. But don't say you won't, because there'll be some people in the party who don't like that. So just don't say anything. <laughs> then he got asked, and these are all things that are real. The question of whether Trump's fit or unfit, the question of whether you go try to rescue the hostages or you don't. And then the third one was, if China attacked Taiwan, would you send American forces to defend Taiwan? Now that could really happen also. While the next president's in office. So it would be nice if you all to, for you all to know what we would do. I take this issue very seriously. And I think that we need to be tough on China. 
and I would be tough on China. And let me tell you about the law I passed in Florida. I say Florida, he says Florida. I don't know if that's the right way to say it or not. But that prevents the Chinese from buying land in Florida. And I'm standing on the stage going like, we're not talking about them buying land in Florida, we're talking about taking land in Taiwan. But okay, won't answer the question. Beware of people who won't answer your question. Because either it's because they don't know the answer, or worse, it's because they think you won't like their answer. But once they get power, they will execute on that. And Nikki's a little bit different. It's not that Nikki won't answer the question. It's that she gives multiple answers to the questions, depending on where she is. So if she's in Iowa. She recognizes her consultants have told her that people are generally more conservative in Iowa in the Republican Party than they are here in New Hampshire. So when she gets asked about abortion in Iowa, she says, yes, I would sign a six-week ban on abortion. She said that just three weeks ago in a forum, a conservative forum in Iowa. When she's here, she says, I don't want to divide people. I don't want to come up with some artificial number. I want people to make their own decisions because she's in the middle of the live free or die state. So she says, I don't want to make decisions for you. Well, which one is it? Is it when she's in Iowa and she says she'd sign a six week abortion ban? Or is it when she's in New Hampshire and she's going to let you all make your own decisions on that issue? I can't tell you which one she really believes. I don't know. But it worries me that she won't answer. So, since I've been critical of those people, I did answer those questions, but I'm going to answer them real quick and then take your questions. Donald Trump is unfit to be President of the United States. He should never be behind the desk in the Oval Office again under any circumstances. He is unfit for the job, both by his personality, his temperament, and his conduct. He is unfit. Two, if there was a reasonable plan that we'd be successful in rescuing the eight American hostages and any other Israeli hostages that were around them, I would send American Special Forces there to get them and bring them home. Three, if China attacks Taiwan, America will go and defend Taiwan if I'm President of the United States. And on abortion, I would not sign any national ban on abortion. I believe that every state and its people, most importantly, should make that decision. We fought as conservatives for 50 years saying that Roe versus Wade was wrong because it was a group of nine justices in a courtroom who took away the rights from the American people to decide that really difficult and emotional issue that you should decide for yourselves. And then we win that fight. And we get Roe overturned, and then we got a bunch of people who get on the stage and say, and now, if I'm in charge of the federal government, I'd like to make the decision for you. And they see nothing hypocritical about that. I wouldn't sign a national ban on abortion. I'm personally pro-life. That's the way I was raised. It's what I believe. But I don't believe I should substitute my judgment for yours. In the end, the people of New Hampshire, the people of Iowa, the people of New Jersey, should make the decision. And when you think about how important that issue is and how important life is and how precious it is, and then you look at the Congress of the United States, who took three weeks to elect a speaker from their own party, and who held up over 400 military promotions playing political games, you trust them with the decision of life and death? I don't. And by the way, if it's decided by Congress, it could change every two years. You have Republicans in charge of Congress, maybe they'd vote to ban something. If the Democrats come back two years later and take Congress back, they'll switch the law for the whole country. Why should people live like that? That's such an important emotional issue. The people should decide, not the politicians. So since I criticize them for not answering the questions or giving multiple answers, there are my answers. So, now we're going to go to questions. We are not going to run this like other town halls get run.
by other candidates who come here who have their staff come in and interview you beforehand and figure out which one of you has a really nice question for me and then hand the microphone to you. We're just going to have you raise your hands. We have some folks here with microphones. The reason is not because the room is so big that we can't speak without microphones, but these guys get sensitive when they can't hear all the questions and the answers and want to play them later. So that's why we'll go with microphones. So raise your hand. Happy to answer questions from anybody about anything. All right, let's start with you in the back with the hat on. <coughs> Governor Christie, thank you for coming out today. Thank you. I noticed in your speech one of the key issues that you don't mention is climate change. With the backdrop of COP28, um, thinking about climate change from a corporate perspective, 70, or, sorry, approximately 100 companies account for 70% of global climate emissions, knowing that most of those com companies are based in the United States. You've previously made the position that you believe climate change is an issue that should be handled privately. What strategies as president would you implement to see climate resiliency, not only in New Hampshire, but across the country and world, but also how are you going to hold those companies accountable in that system? Thank you. Sure. Well, first off, um, if I talked about every issue that I thought was really important, we'd never get to your questions. And I figure I usually get to those issues because you care about them. Um, let me start off by saying I have always believed and I still believe now that climate change is real and that human activity contributes to it. And that anybody who doesn't believe that is living in a fantasy world that doesn't, it absolutely ignores the science. Second, I don't think it should be handled purely privately. I think it has to be handled in both ways, both governmentally and privately, because the government cannot ever impose enough laws in order to change private conduct exclusively. You need to get their buy-in to do it as well. But the government can't ignore the problem and shouldn't. And I think we're doing a lot of things, and I did a lot of things as governor of New Jersey that I'm really proud of. Um, that reduced our carbon emissions significantly. When I was governor of New Jersey, we were the second largest solar producing state in the country because we invested in solar energy in New Jersey and made it widely available to people, both from a business perspective and from a residential perspective. And it made a real difference in terms of the amount of solar energy we were producing. In New Jersey, and I would do, I'm citing New Jersey now because I would, these are the things I would do if I were president because I saw they worked in New Jersey. Second, we're the most densely populated state in the country, but 53% of our electricity is generated by nuclear power. We are underutilizing nuclear power in this country. It is much safer than it's ever been. It absolutely contributes nothing to carbon, and it is reliable. Unlike solar and wind right now, which are less reliable, less robust to be able to support the grid. Nuclear is incredibly reliable. 53% of the electricity in a state of 9 million people and a lot of heavy industry is supported by nuclear power. So I would set up governmental incentives to encourage the states to start approving a lot more nuclear power plants to provide the type of base load electric support that we need. Third, I continue as I did in New Jersey to invest in solar and in wind to get it to the point where it could be a much more robust contributor to our overall energy package. Fourth, I built two natural gas pipelines in New Jersey when I was governor. And I did it because I wanted to stop burning coal in New Jersey. And we did. We don't burn coal in New Jersey anymore. And that has helped us reduce our carbon footprint. Now, I recognize that natural gas adds to the carbon footprint, but it adds in a much less significant way than coal does. And for you, all of you here in New Hampshire and throughout New England who have been deprived of having natural gas as an option, it has much less of a carbon footprint and a lower cost than home heating oil. And so I think my approach to this would be that in the places where we can go to no carbon emission, emission and keep reliability, like nuclear, like enhancing solar and wind, and hydropower too. I want those innovations to continue to happen so they become more and more prominent. But in the interim, what we have to go to is the least contributing to our carbon footprint. So let's get away from coal and substitute with natural gas, which we have an abundant supply of in this country. Let's get away from home heating oil and substitute it with natural gas. 
And as we, but at the same time, we continue to develop these other energies which have either no contributions carbon or even less. That's what I would do as a leader in this country to move us towards that. Um, I continue to be supportive um, of electric vehicles, but I would not mandate them. American people don't like mandates. And they don't respond to them. And I saw, you know, we have a good friend um, in our town who is one of the biggest Chevy dealers in the country. And he told us recently that they have a 12-month supply of electric vehicles in his dealerships. No one wants them because they were mandated to build them. On the other hand, if you go and try to buy a Tesla... It's not as easy. Why? Because people like them. They like them. And so in that place, when you talk about private, that's why I want the private sector to be making decisions and not the government. So Elon Musk has become the richest man in the world, in part because of government subsidies, but also in part because he came up with a better idea. And the vehicle that they built and developed is something that people like. And so they want to buy it. I, would, I think the American people would be fine with going to electric vehicles if they thought they were reliable and they liked them because they would also think they're contributing something positive to our environment. So we got to let that thing develop the way it needs to. The last piece I'd say is this. We in this country over the last 10 years have decreased our carbon output by a billion tons a year. At the very same time, the Chinese have increased their carbon output in those 10 years by 5 billion tons a year. So we can't be fooled in America that we're going to solve this problem on our own. So part of what the job of the next president is going to be is to engage China, in this instance, as a friend with common interest. I would assume they want their children and grandchildren to have clean air and clean water too. I would assume they don't want the earth to be destroyed because it would be destroyed just as much for them as it would be for us. So I think the next president has to engage the Chinese and say, look, you've had your industrial revolution. Enough now. Stop with adding 5 billion tons of carbon to the atmosphere every year. You have to get on a program now with us to bring your carbon output down. We'll continue to do our part, but we can't sit by and permit them to continue to do what they're doing, because if we do... What we're doing is helping a little bit, but what they're doing is causing the demise to come much more quickly than it should. And I think that's got to be part of your thinking, too. It's not just what we do. We live in a world that's becoming smaller and smaller all the time. And what they do in China by burning all the coal that they burn is going to affect the quality of our life here in the United States as well, so we have to engage them on it. So that's what I would do on the, those issues. And, you know, in the end, it's, it's a, an emblematic issue of what I said at the beginning, which is it's going to affect your life much more than it's going to affect mine. And so you should know where we stand on this stuff so that we're helping to make matters better for you, not worse. All right. Yes, ma'am. Um, before I ask my quick question, I just want to say um, my husband and I have to leave early. I have a doctor's appointment in Portsmouth, but I didn't want to miss this. I just didn't want to miss it. It's killing me that I can't stay for the whole thing. I have a quick question. When you become the Republican nominee, would you consider Liz Cheney as your running mate? <laughs> well, it's a really interesting question because Liz got asked yesterday on CNN why she hasn't endorsed me. Uh, because we sound very similar on these issues. And Liz still didn't endorse me. So maybe she needs to endorse me before I consider her for vice president. Um, so uh, I, I, I stand here in anxious anticipation of, I have great respect for Liz, I've known her for a long time, I worked in the administration where her father was the vice president, and so I got to know Liz all the way back then when I was the U.S. attorney in New Jersey, appointed by President Bush, and, um, and I have great respect for her, and I think that her voice is a very important one in the conversation we're having right now. Um, but... Time to step up, you know. There's no one else on that stage who's saying the things she's saying, and she admitted that in the interview. Governor Christie's the only one up there telling the truth about Donald Trump. Well, okay. And she says that Trump is the single most important issue 
in this race. Let me tell you why I think she hasn't endorsed me. Because I think she's still thinking about running herself as a third party candidate. Um, and so she wants to keep hope alive there. And if she endorses me, then that kind of precludes her from doing it. Um, so I think she may have her eye on something else um, other than being my vice president. But I would say this. Um, she's a real conservative. She has a great record in Congress. And I find her in my conversations, interaction with her, to be a good, honest person. And those are the beginnings of the prerequisites that you would need to have someone be your partner. But um, she also got to like me and support me. Um, and if she does, then, um, then, then that will become maybe more serious consideration. But thank you for taking the time to come this morning. Escort yourself out whenever you need to, okay? Um, yes, sir, right there. I want to thank you for your time and energy of what you've done in the past. Yeah, let's get that microphone so people okay. can hear you. I want to thank you for your time and energy in the past we've done in running for president. That takes a lot of courage. Um, you gave a very elegant answer to the person about the global. My thing with the president is how are you going to inform the whole country or as much as possible as president of why you're doing things? You know, it's interesting because I think part of my experience as governor, given where I was governor, helps to inform that answer. You know, I, I operated in the, the first and fourth largest media markets in America. Uh, New Jersey doesn't have its own media market. So the northern half of our state is covered by the New York media market. The southern half of our state is covered by the Philadelphia media market, number one and number four. And so as a result, I'm covered by more media than any other governor in the country, the possible exception of California. And so you learn early on how powerful that communication tool is. And you become better at it, or worse. <laughs> but I think I became better at it over time. Uh, the President of the United States cannot be afraid to use the bully pulpit, the media, to communicate in every way that he can to his people about exactly what he's doing and why he's doing it. Um, that's part of the reason that, you know, I don't think Nikki Haley is right for this job is, you know, um, these folks follow us around all over the place. Um, uh, they represent all the different networks, and um, they go to every one of our events. She doesn't talk to them. You'll see me after my events. I'll stop. They'll set up their cameras, and I take all their questions, and some of them are really good, and some of them are just, as they call them, fun. Um, but I take all of them. And the reason I do it is because I think you have a right to hear what I think about all those different things. Nikki takes three or four questions at a town hall meeting that are pre-picked beforehand. And she gets off the stage. She doesn't take questions from people informally. And she doesn't do many media interviews at all. And when she does, she does them mostly on Fox News. I think that if you want to be an effective communicator and get people to support you, and your policies once you're president. You have to be in front of them regularly, taking questions, and subjecting yourself to what is often an unpleasant process. Because most of the time, those questions are, you know, especially when they come from the media, kind of crappy. And with an agenda. Like if you watched the debate the other night, Megyn Kelly didn't ask one positive question to any of us. Your record stinks for this reason, explain it. You're wrong about this, explain it. No one likes you. The question is question I got. No one likes you. <laughs> really is it. No one likes you. Why are you running? <laughs> right? That is, in front of millions of people, that is not the most pleasant experience. <laughs> um, but as Mary Pat will often say to me, when, if I complain privately about that stuff, she'll say to me, no one put a gun to your head. You're doing this voluntarily. And so I remember that all the time. And so what I would do as president is have forums like this regularly around the country. I did it as governor. I did over 150 town halls um, when I was the sitting governor. And it was the, one of the best things I did, and I would repeat it as president, 
because then I got to know what real people thought. I didn't just hear questions from the press. But I also got questions from folks like you. And I think it helped to keep me more grounded in understanding what you really care about. Sometimes it matched up with the press questions, but sometimes it didn't. I think you have to use that. I think you have to use social media as a president. And not in the way Donald Trump does, by doing a social media post at 2.03 a.m. on Thanksgiving morning to list all the people you hate that you're thankful for. <laughs> right? I mean, can you imagine that Thanksgiving message, right? I'm thankful for all the people I hate, and here they are. I, you know, I would communicate a bit differently than that. Um, the people that, um, I don't think at the moment in my life I hate anybody. I think it's a really harsh word. It was one of those words that my mother um, used to admonish us for. I'd say, I hate this or hate this person or hate that. She'd say, hey, you don't hate anybody. You may, not, you may dislike them. You may not prefer them. You don't hate them. But Donald Trump has made hate a regular word in our vocabulary. I need to, as president to take that out of our vocabulary. Um, and the last thing I'd say in response to this is, if you're president who wants to bring the country together, and that's what I want to do, that doesn't mean you want to get the country to agree on everything, because that is a fool's errand. This country will never agree with each other on everything. But if you want people to respect each other again, then you have to show them respect as president and set that example and not be calling people all of the awful things that he has said over the course of his career. You know, I just think it's wrong. And I think you have to treat your adversaries with respect. And some people the other night, the media has been kind of obsessed with this for the last couple of days. Why did I defend Nikki Haley on the debate stage? Right? Because I like her. I've known her for 13 years. We've been friends for 13 years. We served as governors together. She campaigned for me. I campaigned for her when I was running for governor and she was running for governor. Nikki is a good person. I don't want her to be president, but she's a good person. Everyone thinks there's some ulterior motive. No, I got sick and tired of having some guy on that stage compare her intellect to his three-year-old son. Right? That shows absolutely no respect for her on a personal basis, and it's undeserved. And so if you're looking for the kind of tone that I'll try to set, watch that. We have our differences. I'm going to try to beat her, but I respect her, and she's earned that respect. That's something that I gave her. She's a two-term governor, a former U.N. ambassador, and a smart, accomplished woman, and she deserves and has earned that respect. And when Vivek did not show her that respect on stage, he doesn't diminish her. He diminishes himself. And he looks like the immature guy that he is. Because that was a comment of, born of immaturity. Because he's smart. He's a smart guy. That's immaturity. And that's Donald Trump's type of immaturity. And maybe he's, you know, imitating the wrong kind of person. And I think that's where that comes from. And that's the way I would try to conduct myself differently. All right. Yes, sir, right there. Thank you, Governor Christie. Um, my question is, so I'm a moderate who voted for Biden last cycle. Um, that being said, I think the biggest threat to America right now is the polarization within our politics. And so my question is, um, specifically to the rhetoric you were speaking about on the debate stage, what do you think the role is the president has to de-escalate within our country? And how would you seek to depolarize our political climate? Well, I partly answered that question right before by mistake, so sorry to answer it partially before you got to answer it, but I'll, I'll answer it a little more fully. Look, I think there's a difference between disagreement and polarization. This country was set up to be a disagreement. With all the different branches of government and the checks and balances, we were set up to be an argument. The founders wanted it to be that way. They didn't want a king. They were leaving a king. They wanted to have an argument, but they wanted an argument that led to a conclusion. What we have in America today, and that's why differences are different than polarization, when differences become polarization, you get no results. The argument becomes the end itself. I just want to keep arguing. Because if I keep arguing, I never have to compromise. If I keep arguing, I don't have to acknowledge that there are right points to my opponent's argument. 
If I keep arguing, I keep raising money because I keep angering people with the argument. And when they get angry, they go on the phone and say, I'll give him 50 bucks, sure, right? Because I like that argument. We have the wrong types of incentives right now. And in part, I have to blame all of you. Because politicians respond to what they think will make them successful. And we have had examples of the polarization you're talking about be rewarded with votes. So this has to be a joint effort. Um, I want to decrease the polarization, and the way I intend to do it is the way I did it when I was governor. Now understand my state. We are one of the bluest states in the country. We have not elected a Republican to the United States Senate in 51 years. It's the longest streak of any state in America. Longer than New York, longer than California, longer than Illinois. Any of the states that you think are really blue, get in line behind us. We have not elected a Republican United States Senator in 51 years. When I became governor of New Jersey, I got elected with 48% of the vote in a three-way race, so I didn't win the majority of the vote, and I had a Democratic legislature. And I had a Democratic legislature for every day that I was governor, every hour that I was governor. <laughs> I had a Democratic legislature, right? So you got to decide early on, what am I going to be? Am I going to be the guy who stands in the corner, yells and screams, and with my personality, makes headlines, but doesn't accomplish anything? Or are you going to try it a different way? I decided to try it a different way. So during the transition to the governorship, um, I surprised the Senate president, who, by the way, is a guy named Steve Sweeney, who is president of the Iron Workers Union in New Jersey. So another shy and retiring guy, it's just like me, I just showed up at his office one day unannounced as the governor-elect. And his office is two hours away from where I live. So I told the troopers, drive me down there, and said, well, sir, you don't have an appointment. I said, I think he'll see me. Um, so I show up at his office, and his secretary is all nervous. So he, uh, he's not expecting you. And I said, well, is he here? If he's here, I'd like to see him. Uh, okay, I'll go check. And then I realized why he didn't want to come out. He had just gotten back from the gym. He wasn't expecting anybody. He was in a t-shirt and sweatpants. And, and uh, he comes out and goes, Governor, what are you, Governor Lex, what are you doing here? I, expect, I said, well, I was in the neighborhood. I decided to stop by. He goes, bullshit, your neighborhood is two hours away. And I said, I wanted to come and talk to you, just you and I. Do you have five minutes? And he said, sure. So we went into his conference room, just the two of us. And I said, Steve, look. I said, we could do really well at arguing with each other for the next eight years. And he said, four years. I said, eight years. <laughs> and um, I said, or we could decide we want to put touchdowns in the end zone. I want to tell you I'm here today because I want to put touchdowns in the end zone. And I know that means that sometimes I'm going to have to keep promises to you that are politically unpopular for me. But I promise you this. If I give you my word on something, I will always stand by it even if it turns out to be politically unpopular for me, if you're willing to do the same. So it's up to you, what do you want to do? And I will tell you that was the most important 10 seconds of my eight years. Because the success or failure of my administration was going to be determined in those 10 seconds. And he's a big guy. He's like six foot two, huge hands. What do you expect of an iron worker? He stands up and he puts his big hand out and he said, let's put touchdowns in the end zone. And we shook hands, and we kept our word to each other for the next eight years. Now, it was hard, and we had lots of public fights. I remember one weekend going down to the bottom of the driveway to get the newspaper, the biggest newspaper in the state, on the Sunday, and the headline said, Sweeney, colon, I want to punch Christy in the head. <laughs> so it didn't always go like swimmingly, okay? I mean, <laughs> we had our fights. But always we promised each other, before it got to polarization, we would get in a room and try to resolve it. Now, most of the times we resolved it in a way that forged compromise and got something done. Sometimes we would teach them and say, we can't fix this one. We can't solve it. So we stopped talking about it. We put it aside and moved on to the next thing. We didn't let it define what our relationship was. All of that only happens if you want to engage in that human relationship. That would not have happened if I hadn't gone down to that office. It wouldn't have. And so part of what you need to do as president to reduce the polarization is to start to remember again this is a people business. Get to know the people in Congress. 
You have the greatest home field advantage as president in the world. You have the Oval Office. You have Camp David, Air Force One. Hell, man, if you can't use that stuff to like, kind of bring people around a little bit, you're completely an oaf. you got to be able to do this, right? And, but the problem with it is got to spend time. It takes time. I used to tease Mary Pat that we would have more meals and spend more time with people, not only that we didn't agree with, but that we didn't even like when I was governor, but people elected them. And they had a right to be heard, and we needed to find a way to work with them. So that's the way I would do it. And it worked in New Jersey. And the evidence of that is, when I stood for re-election, I got 61% of the vote in a blue state. And that makes a testimony for other folks. We won 70% of independents. I won 25% of Democrats. And 29% of African Americans. 51% of Latinos. Everybody in our state didn't agree with me. But everybody in my state felt like they were being heard. And I think that's what reduces the polarization. If you feel like you're being heard and your argument's being considered and it reaches a different conclusion, you can live with it most of the time. It's when you're ignored, when you're marginalized, that people then get angry and they get polarized. So it's a great question, and that's the way I would deal with it as president. It's the way I dealt with it as governor, and it worked for me. Yes, ma'am. Hi there. I'll give you mine. Oh, thank you. Um, my name is Kathy. I'm from Durham, and I'm currently registered as an independent voter. So I have a vote to spend. Um, you talked God about. Bless you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you talked about your concerns about the border, and I guess I'd like to talk about a bigger context to that. There are 110 million refugees in this world. Uh, about 33 million of them are living in places outside their own home country because. Uh, violence, persecution, natural disasters. The President of the United States has this unique um, privilege outside of Congress of setting a quota for refugee admission through the U.S. Refugee Admission Program. Those refugees go through at least a year to two years of vetting. Under Trump, that number came down to zero. Even under Biden and Obama, we're up to about 125,000 a year, which is just a speck, uh, just a drop in the ocean. What, what would you do as president in terms of refugee admission um, so that these, some of these people have a, have a chance of a better life? Thank you. Thank you. You know, look, that's another example of why I love these. I, I've been running for president now for the last six months. I've never been asked that question before. I've done... 40 town halls just in New Hampshire? Never been asked that question. So it goes back to the point I was making earlier in response to you. These things, and why I would continue to do them is because every time I get a question that I didn't expect, and that's really good. So here's my answer. I think that if we're going to do that, the thing we have to do at the same time is get control over the southern border. Because... We are, in essence, accepting thousands and thousands and thousands of refugees a day with no plan or program. Because a lot of those folks are economic refugees or political refugees who are coming over the southern border. They're, they're engaging in self-help rather than going through the process that you talk about on the refugee side, the formal refugee side where we go through all kinds of vetting. There's no vetting going on at the southern border. So here's my, my issue with it. Until I get that on a path, it doesn't have to be fixed completely, immediately, to be able to consider bringing other folks in through the formal program. But it needs to get on a path to fix it. So I'm not going to give you a number this morning because I think that would just, I'd just be making it up, to be frank with you. But what I do believe is we've got six million open jobs in this country. So let's talk practically. In this economy right now, we have six million open jobs. The way we've always fixed that problem, and we've had it throughout our history, is to bring in immigrants who had the skills to fill those jobs, learned our language, paid taxes, and became a part of the American fabric. I want to get back to that. The refugee program is one of the ways you can do it. 
and fixing our immigration system is another way to do it. But to do that with credibility where the American people will accept it, you got to fix the southern border. Because if they feel like we want to accept more people through the front door, but we will do nothing to fix the people who are sneaking in the back door, people are going to be rightfully angry about that. So let me use this as an opportunity to give you my five points on fixing that. Because you heard Governor DeSantis the other night. He says he's going to shoot stone cold dead anybody who comes over the border with a backpack. Because you can assume they're a drug dealer. And without a trial or even a search, he's going to instruct people just to shoot them. Now that's TV tough guy talk. And it's stupid. And if I shot everybody here with a backpack, the whole campus would go down. <laughs> and I think all of you with a backpack are not drug dealers, right? But he's assuming that that's the case. Ron's a smart guy. He doesn't really believe that. He just wants to sound tough. Complicated problem. We should do five things. One, send the National Guard to the border on my first day. Because our Customs and Border Patrol officers are overwhelmed down there. 200,000 illegal encounters a month for the last 11 months. They're overwhelmed. There's not enough of them to deal with the problem. So that's the National Guard to help them. Second, hire 10,000 new Customs and Border Patrol officers. And it's going to take a year, though, to get them recruited, trained, and deployed. So as you send them, you take an exact number of National Guardsmen and women out as they come in. Send them back home. Third, we need to make sure that we build more beds to detain people at the border. 200,000 encounters a month, you know how many beds we have? 38,000. So I went to law school because I couldn't do math or science, but I can even do that math, not good. So I would double the number of beds to 80,000. Fourth, people come in here claiming asylum. They deserve a hearing. They have to wait four years for a hearing. So what happens? Can't detain them for four years. So we release them into the country and say, hey, how about you come back to El Paso in four years um, and have your hearing where we might kick you out of the country after you've been living here for four years. They don't come back. So we need to triple the number of immigration judges. If we did that, we could bring it down to below a year before they get a hearing, and we could detain them that long. And that's the right way to do it, because then for folks who are self-identifying as refugees, is what I would call that, we can then vet them and give them their hearing to test whether their refugee status is really legitimate or not. And if it is, they get admitted to the country. And if it isn't, they get sent home. Fifth, we need to change the immigration laws in this country. We haven't done it for 40 years. People are coming in illegally because they can't figure out a way to come in legally. And so we need to go to merit-based immigration. What are those six million jobs? What in what areas do we need people? If you've got those skills, you go to the front of the line. Let's have employers use E-Verify so they know what they're doing or not doing, whether it's legal or not. But to get that, to get back to your question, we need to give the Democrats something in return, or else they won't give us those things. They don't want E-Verify. They don't want a system of merit-based immigration. So maybe we'll have to give them something on dreamers. Maybe we'll have to give them something on path to citizenship. But digging our heels in the ground like they're doing and saying, my way or the highway, leads to what we have now. If I can implement those five steps, at the same time then, we can set up an increase in permitting people who have a verified refugee status to be able to come into this country because then we can deal with the to real total number will be and make sure that we can absorb it. So I think that's the way to do it. That's not an answer you can give in 90 seconds on a debate stage, right? And that's not something that shoot them stone cold dead. It's complicated, but the issue is complicated. And people's lives are precious. And as the American president, you should treat it that way. And you deserve answers that have that level of thought in them not shoot them stone cold dead. Um, or, or we're going to send, Nikki said she's going to send the American army into Mexico. Really? We live in the safest, most welcoming neighborhood in the world. And we're going to send the American army into Mexico. Come on. 
you're treating people stupidly. And we've had that done to us before. Remember, there was a guy who ran who said he was going to big, build a big, beautiful wall along the entire border of Mexico, and Mexico was going to pay for it. We got 52 miles of new wall in four years and gotten the first peso yet from Mexico. Right? So let's not go for the TV tough guy talk. Let's go with smart answers that can work, and that's why I would deal with that issue. Thank you. All right. Yes. Hi, thank you, Chris, for coming in to talk to us this morning. Um, at the beginning, you spoke for a little bit about how both Republicans and Democrats uh, have added significantly to the national debt. So I was wondering if you could just please expound and clarify on what your plan is to really slash the debt. The first thing you need to do to slash the debt is slash the deficit, right? The deficit is an annual number. The debt is an accumulated number. So first thing to do is to make sure that you're not going to add to the debt anymore. So first thing I would do is I would bring us back to pre-COVID spending. We still spend at the level we spent during COVID. It makes no sense. We don't have COVID here in anywhere near the number that we had it before. Yet we're still spending money at the COVID level. If we just brought spending back to pre-COVID levels, you would take a trillion dollars off of the annual deficit. Our deficit this year is 1.8 trillion. You would take it from 1.8 trillion to 800 billion. Good step in the right direction to start with. Second, I would go to something that I did when I was governor of New Jersey when I inherited an $11 billion deficit on a $29 billion budget. And we have to budget, we have to balance our budget every year, not like the feds. So there's no option. I have five months to fix it. I went to something called zero-based budgeting. And what it is is instead of your departments coming in and saying, here's where I spent last year, how much more can I spend? You say to them, no, you come in at zero. And you justify to me every program that you have in your department. By doing that and learning about every one of the programs, in my first year I eliminated 832 programs at the state level and we were able to balance the budget without raising taxes. Now, the truth of it that you should know is that when I eliminated those 832 programs, and I got Democrats to vote for that, but when I did it, my popularity went from 55% to 38%. Because every one of those programs had a constituency. Somebody liked one of those programs. And when I eliminated them, they said, well, I don't like him anymore. No. So you've got to be ready if you do that in the federal level, that you're going to become really unpopular really fast. But, as I said in answer to his question, I went from that 38% to 61% for re-election. And I think the reason for that was because I kept my promise. I told them, I can balance this budget without raising taxes. And it's not going to be easy, but we're going to do it. They didn't like every step I took in doing it, but they liked the fact that I did it and that I kept my promise. I would do the same thing as president. It will not be done in four years. We won't be able to go from $1.8 trillion to balance in four years. It's more likely it will take six to eight because you couldn't take that much out that quickly without really hurting people. You know, Vivek said he's going to fire 75% of the federal workforce. Try to take an airplane from an airport when he fires 75% of the federal workforce and we lose all those air traffic controllers. Try to go to the supermarket and buy food that's safe when we eliminate all of those food inspectors. Try to go to the pharmacy and get prescription drugs that won't kill you after we eliminate all the scientists who review the prescription drugs to make sure that they're safe or not. I mean, this is again the sophistry of that kind of approach. You can't do it. It sounds good. I'm going to fire them all on the first day. Okay, good. Good for you. But it's not going to work. So it will take some time to do it. But I did it in New Jersey. I balanced the budget for eight years in a row without raising any taxes. And it takes discipline. In the ten years before I became governor, state spending went up over 50%. In my eight years as governor, state spending went up 15%. So less than 2% a year. And 90% of that 2% was pension, health insurance, and debt service. So stuff that you don't have an option on. So that means two-tenths of 1% is what the discretionary spending went up a year, each year, for years. That's discipline. That's the kind of discipline that needs to be brought back to the federal budget. Because if we don't, we are going to become a country where no one will buy our debt anymore. And then we're going to be in real big trouble. And it's going to affect you 
like I said at the top, much more is going to affect me. So I can take one more question before I have to head to my next campus. Let's go to the guy right in the back. Thank you, Governor. Um, I just want to add, I'm from New Jersey. I've lived there the past few years. Where? Uh, Bergen County. Okay. There's 70 towns. Which one? River Edge. River Edge. Great. Thanks. <laughs> um, I do have to say what you say about New Jerseyans is true. And I do like how, even though I disagree with you on some things, you are very straightforward with answers. Um, so I want to say, for people of my generation, you know, I don't think Trump is the biggest issue for us. We're worried about being able to afford a house, a car, pay off college. Polls show we're the most depressed generation, you know, drugs, fear of getting drafted in a potential war. Can you elaborate on some specific policies that would benefit, like, younger voters? Sure. Thank you. Um, so first... Um, by doing what I, I just talked about with what he said, we're going to benefit you both long-term and near-term. The long-term benefit you know we won't be adding to your debt that you'll have to pay back. But in the near term, what will happen is interest rates will go down because we're borrowing less money. Um, inflation will go down so that when you work, you're going to be able to afford to buy more, spend more, to help support your lifestyle. You want to try to buy a home. Interest rates will be at 2 or 3% rather than at 7 or 8%. That makes the difference between someone being be able to afford it and not afford it. Um, secondly, in those areas where we need help in this country, and we need help in having more people to provide mental health care and more people to provide addiction care, more doctors who are general practitioners who can help us with well care. We do really great at sick care in this country, but we don't do really good at well care. Because we don't have enough doctors for people to see on a regular basis. If people went into those areas, that's why I give student loan forgiveness. Is in areas where if you go to a place where we really need help, and addiction services is to me the biggest one, you want to go into that business? You want to go in and be trained to be a counselor, to be a, an addiction, um, addiction doctor? I'll forgive your student loans. I'm not going to give student loan forgiveness for everybody. Because I don't think it's fair if you haven't taken a student loan that with your taxes you have to pay somebody else's. But if I can say to that same person who didn't take a student loan, look, we're going to forgive his student loan. But what you're going to get in return is we're going to have much broader addiction treatment in this country. And we won't have 110,000 people die of overdose next year like we did last year. And it won't be the leading killer among men 18 to 34 anymore. I think most American taxpayers would say that's something worth investing in. So that I would do. Um, third... Let's talk about colleges like the one you're in now and how this affects folks and affects the depression that you're talking about. I just got the bill. Our daughter is a junior at Notre Dame, our fourth. Um, I just got her bill for second semester. Room and board, all the rest, everything all in. It's $40,035 for the second semester. I, we had our second daughter went there. She graduated um, from there in 2018, so just five years ago. It was 60000 for a year. So in five years, Notre Dame has gone from 60000 to 80000 It's insane. And I would tell you the reason I think that happens is because these colleges and universities are not held to a standard because there's so much student loan money out there that they figure, eh, I'll raise it this much, they'll just borrow more, and they'll pay it, and then you get stuck with the bill. Here's what I would do. If any college or university increases their total cost from one year to the next above the rate of inflation, they get no federal funding of any kind. None. Guess what? Tuition and room and board would only go up at the rate of inflation. And if it did, in all these years we were at about 2% inflation a year, these costs would be significantly less. Think about in the last five years, from going from 60 to 80. And look, Notre Dame's a great school. There's lots of great schools out there. My daughter loves it. She's getting a good education. I'm happy for that. But seriously, 80000 bucks a year after it was 65 years ago? We need to make this affordable for you. And there's no reason why it has to go up that much. They raise it that much because they can. And it, you know, if you can get away with charging more, you charge it. That's what our society is like, right? But if we say to them, no more, that's the way I would control college costs. And it makes the debt you walk out of here with significantly less. 
which gives you more options in a couple ways. What job you can afford to take. You can really follow your passion then maybe if you want, if it's a little bit less money, because you don't have to worry about making that debt payment at such a high level every month. It allows you to be able to do other things with that money, to buy a home, to buy a car, to go on a vacation, to do things that you might want to do that might lift some of that sense of burden that you're feeling rightfully on yourself. And your generation is less hopeful than any generation since mine. I came to college at 18 years old in 1980. Double digit inflation, double digit unemployment, double digit interest rates. Lines to buy gas, hostages in Iran, and the Soviets fighting a war in Afghanistan. And I enter as a freshman at the University of Delaware thinking to myself, what the hell am I doing? How's my life going to be any good? And back in those days, you had a lot of really, really depressed college students who felt like they had no future. I sat there in my dorm room at 18 years old with Jimmy Carter as the president saying to me, you know, it's my fault. There's a malaise in the country. We have to do better. We have to do better. And I decided, shit, I'm voting for Ronald Reagan. Because Ronald Reagan said to me, you're not the problem, we are. Government is not the solution to our problem, government is the problem. And I said, sounds right to me. And he gave me hope. Presidents can give you hope by what they do and how they conduct themselves. And if they put their minds back into your mind in terms of where you are right now and what you realistically think the possibilities are for your future. In eight years, he transformed what I felt like. I went to college in those years and then went to law school. And when he left office in 1989, I was a first year lawyer. I was married. I was able to afford to buy my first house. And my life was transformed in large part because of a president who did things and said things that made me believe in myself again, made the country believe in themselves, and things changed. So that's part of the reason I'm running, is that inspiration from being where you're sitting now 40 years ago, 43 years ago, and, and feeling like I was hopeless. And it, one president transforming that. A lot of other people contributed to it, but he was the voice. He was the voice, as you mentioned before. He was the voice. So those are the kind of things I would do, and a lot of other stuff too. Look, the last thing I'll mention since I talked about addiction, Let's face it, everybody. Addiction is a disease. Dumb moral failing, it's a disease. And it needs to be treated, and it can be treated. And we need to lower the stigma on addiction. I'm not saying I accept it, or I think it's good. It's not. But people get addicted, and it's a disease like cancer, or heart disease, or diabetes, or high blood pressure. It can be treated, and we can save lives. And the other thing I would do for people of your generation is to work with you to end the stigma that goes along with asking for help. Because we have too much suicide in this country and too many overdoses. And those both relate to people feeling unable to ask for help. It's because we judge them when they say they have that problem, either mental health or addiction, and they hide, and it ultimately becomes overwhelming. We need to do much better on that, and I would do much better than that as president. So, um, i got to go to my next campus, on the Christie Campus Tour. But I am happy to be at UNH, and even though I'm a University of Delaware guy, and we used to play football against each other all the time, um, I still am happy to be here. Um, I thank you for coming, and I'll end with this. I'll end where I started. New Hampshire can make the difference here. Do not accept polls as inevitable. John McCain in 2008 came to the state. They said his campaign was dead. He lost Iowa. They said there was no chance he could win. He won New Hampshire. He became the nominee. In 2016, Donald Trump, no one thought Donald Trump was going to be president of the United States. Came down that elevator, came to New Hampshire. He won two to one in New Hampshire, and it drove him to the nomination and ultimately to the presidency. You're going to make the decision. Don't let anybody make it for you. You make it. You have the chance to come out here and meet all of us and judge us by looking us in the eye and listening to us. And then don't go try to figure out who's going to win. Decide who you want to win. 
and then go and make that happen for that person. Because I will tell you this, if I win the primary here in New Hampshire, and it's going to come down to me, Donald Trump, and Nikki Haley. That's what it's going to come down to here. I win this primary, I'm going to be the nominee. If I'm the nominee, I will beat Joe Biden. And then we're going to go to a whole new era in our politics in this country. And there will be four words ringing in my head when I take the oath of office on January 20th of 2025. Thank you, New Hampshire. Because you're the ones who are going to make it happen. So don't give in. Don't give up. For the students here, get registered and vote. Vote your interests. Vote for the person who you think is going to make your life more hopeful and more possible. And for old folks like us, we're not ready to hand in, the, hand in our gavel yet. We're not ready to give in or give up. And you can make a difference. So thanks for welcoming me to UNH. I appreciate it.